Hi. So I'm Alexandra Giannopoulou. As I told you yesterday, I come from the Blockchain and Society Policy Lab from the University of Amsterdam. And today I'm gonna talk to you about um, how are we applying data protection rules uh, on distributed architectures and on the blockchain. So before, um, before I start, some pre preliminary remarks about, um, well, decentralized technologies. So developing, developing decentralized technologies at scale has always been the, the holy grail of the ideals of decentralization for reorganizing social structures, and blockchain technology is uh, the latest uh, example of that, uh, of that effort. This has been shown, for example, late, um, lately, uh, at the um, uh, decentralized web summit that happened here a couple of weeks ago. Um, so everyone is looking uh, at how uh, blockchain technology will uh, help eliminate uh, unnecessary intermediaries, uh, um, uh, solve the, the problem of trust, um, uh, etc. cetera. So um, the problem that arises with uh, data protection is that by uh, trying to have um, specific uh, speci the specific goal of um, uh, solving trust and going away with um, unnecessary intermediaries and enhancing uh, individual uh, user agency, um, there, there is there is a conceptual incompatibility with uh, with the GDPR with the GDPR and general data protection rules. So on the one hand, we look uh, to the same goal, which is uh, enhancing control of users. Uh, user agency and giving them back control over their, of their, uh, their data, but um, the way that uh, the, the technology and the law try to approach this problem is um, uh, completely different. So on the w one hand, we have uh, decentralization, giving more autonomy on the users, uh, creating a distributed user base, but on the other hand, the law, uh, what, uh, what uh, ended up doing is that uh, it ended up uh, identifying few central actors uh, who would be liable uh, about uh, how they process data, how they control uh, um, users' data, and also by giving uh, more uh, power to users uh, through uh, express consent, through the power to, um, <coughs> to, to withdraw consent, and by uh, reinforcing their agency. So are these two, are these two um, uh, applications of uh, enhancing uh, individual autonomy of, uh, completely incompatible, or uh, is there any way to find a way to make uh, blockchain applications compliant with uh, the GDPR? Uh, another thing that we need to, um, uh, to remember is how we identify um, different actors uh, in the, in, on the blockchain. Uh, so uh, we identify by the way that they uh, control and process uh, data, and that is either by their role in the architecture and the technological infrastructure, or uh, they are also their role in uh, the decision-making processes of when and how and if are we going to process uh, this data. By combining these two features, both technological and governance role, uh, then we can uh, lead, uh, read um, um, a legal qualification and uh, of course, the, the obligations that come with that uh, legal qualification. Uh, to start off with examining whether the GDPR is also um, is compliant on uh, blockchain technologies, we have to first of all uh, go with definitions. So, which data are we talking about? Uh, blockchain technology uh, is a technology that uh, it's basically a distributed uh, database that runs worldwide. So necessarily it needs to be compliant uh, to some extent with uh, data, protection, uh, data protection laws. First of all, we have uh, uh, data that are stored on the blockchain. Uh, plain takes data, but those are kind of unnecessary and they are not uh, very, very uh, oftenly um, uh, used. And then uh, data that refer to the transactions. How are the, the, the data um, uh, stored on the blockchain? They're either, uh, well, the metadata, the hashes, uh, and uh, encrypted personal data. So for example, uh, public keys. Um, so yeah, what does the law say about this data? Uh, the law, the GDPR, makes a distinction between anonymous data and pseudonymous data. So anonymous data are not, uh, do not fall under the scope of the GDPR, uh, but pseudonymous data do. What does that mean? How are the definitions uh, 
put uh, in the in the GDPR. So anonymous data are only the data that uh, are impossible to identify or to lead to an identifiable uh, uh, natural uh, person, while pseudonymous data are personal data that can no, no longer be directly attributed to a natural person, but with com combining different information that can be held by, for example, uh, third parties, uh, they can lead to the identification of uh, of a natural person, of uh, the, um, the subject of the personal data. Uh, what does that mean for blockchain data? So, uh, the Article uh, 29 Working Party, which is uh, what you would call a Euro right now you would call it a European Data Protection Officer, um, has given opinions about uh, anonymization. What does that mean? Uh, how do we? Um, how can we read, uh, reach anonymization? Uh, those are uh, the, uh, they are. Uh, it's an instrument uh, that helps inter interpret the law. So they're not uh, by per se legally binding, but they help uh, guide the, the decisions of uh, especially European courts. Uh, so the Article 29 Working Party on Anonymization has said that uh, processing of personal data should be irre should irreversibly prevent identification. And by that statement, that means that uh, hashing and asymmetric cryptography, so public keys, cannot uh, fall under that category of um, anonymization because, uh, for example, um, an analogy would be uh, think about dynamic IPs uh, that the court of the, the court of justice of the European Union has said that even if uh, the the necessary information is held by the internet service provider that is enough to qualify the dynamic IP as a pseudonymous data and not as an anonymous um, uh, data so similarly for hashing and asymmetric uh, cryptography uh, they fall under the category of uh, pseudonymous data and that obviously as you can uh, understand uh, poses a, a very a very big problem for all blockchains. Um, why? Because, well, uh, there are some data that we simply cannot put uh, off-chain, that we cannot do without it. Some of the personal data uh, that are on the blockchain are absolutely necessary for the function if of the blockchain data. For example, there's, there can be no um, blockchain if we do not have a hashing of blocks. That's the, that's the idea behind the whole, uh, the whole technology. Uh, and also, this is uh, one aspect that is very problematic for the blockchain, and the second aspect is the fact that uh, um, the, uh, it's an append-only an append uh, distributed database that uh, uh, makes it impossible to eliminate, eliminate data, uh, and so that means that um, a lot of data that have been uh, qualified as anonymous now but they will stay on the blockchain forever, maybe with uh, the advancements of technology, they will be uh, well, re-identified in the future with other technological processes. So that also poses a second problem with um, uh, the data that we store on the blockchain. Uh, this is not a new problem. This has been uh, discussed for quite a while now. Um, there are some technical solutions that have been applied because uh, the uh, one positive uh, one positive aspect of uh, of people that of the technical people that are working on a blockchain application is that they are very privacy aware. So they are looking to build uh, privacy enhancing technologies in their in their blockchain to begin with. So the most simple. Uh, the most simple uh, solution that uh, that um, uh, people offer is to store most of the data blockchain, but uh, off chain. But as as I've said before, this is not possible for a lot of types uh, of personal data. So we need to find ways to create privacy enhancing technologies, and this also exists in a lot of ways. So uh, uh, as zero knowledge proof have been mentioned a lot of times, or maybe uh, creating um, ring signatures or other technologies that have been uh, proposed, uh, especially by some uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, however, uh, when we talk about um, privacy enhancing technologies that could lead to anonymization, uh, is there going to be a standard? Are we going to standardize um, specific technologies that uh, we all agree uh, lead to anonymization, or uh, are we just keep uh, uh, are we just going to keep a list that needs to be continuously updated as a suggestion? Because even if it's uh, simply a list, that means that it would not be um, it would not be um, um, legally uh, binding in any way. And uh, secondly, when we're going to standardize uh, technologies, 
who is going to standardize them. That poses problems on uh, the governance side of um, of blockchain uh, technologies and communities. So, do we have any legal solutions for that? So, uh, officially, no. Officially, there is no uh, uh, there is no uh, legal solution to to adopt uh, this this problem. But uh, what has been what has been uh, proposed is, is the fact that we need to accept that some of the data that uh, are circulating on the blockchain are essential on the functioning to the blockchain. And uh, what we need to remember is the the application of a lot of um, rights that are given to data subjects are relatively um, 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 are relative to the, the the applicable technology. So depending on the limits of the technology that uh, we, where the, the data subject uh, goes to claim the, the application of the rights, uh, this these rights are going to be enforced according to uh, the limits of the of the of the technology. So taking taking in consideration the fact that this specific data is essential to the functioning of the blockchain could lead to a, a possible solution. Uh, adopt a lot of the to blockchain standards is something that has also been um, proposed, but this is uh, highly unlikely, specifically because it took us a lot of years and a lot of negotiations to reach uh, to the, the enforcement of a, a European uh, regulation, so this is something that I don't think is going to uh, happen. Uh, so some of the consequences about, with this uh, with this proposed solutions is uh, first of all uh, the data minimization that I mentioned here is the obligation to uh, take uh, uh, technical technical uh, the nece necessary technical measures to um, uh, control and process as as little personal data as possible. And, but that could mean that if we accept that there are some privacy enhancing technologies that could be applied, uh, and if we standardize those technologies, does that mean that users would have the right to turn to the blockchain technology um, uh, developers and, uh, because they didn't use uh, a more or less, uh, or this specific new technology that cr creates a, more, uh, uh, a better application of data minimization uh, obligations? And also that would mean uh, when data where anonymous data that are stored forever on the blockchain, uh, if they become pseudonymous because uh, of because of the advan advancement of technology, what does that mean for user rights? Do the do the do the users need to consent about the data that would uh, that would uh, processed uh, a while ago? And how do what are, what are the obligations of the actors that are um, uh, related to uh, to, the, to that specific blockchain? And that leads us to the second part of uh, this presentation, which is, uh, yeah, blockchain actors and GDPR compliance. Uh, you've probably heard again of those terms. So what are the, the two main actors that uh, the GDPR creates for data processing is we have Article 4 of the, block of the GDPR. Data controllers are the people, the institutions, the actors that determine uh, the purposes and the means of the processing of, of personal data. So they're the, the people that um, uh, are in charge of the decision-making processes and about pr processing and collecting personal data and the data processors that are simply processing the personal data on behalf uh, of the controller. So here I'm going to take a very, um, a very, very simple uh, example of a blockchain technology. It's not at all representative of what actually happens, but this is just for the sake of the of the discussion to uh, give you some of the examples of the um, um, of the problems that could arise. So we're going to examine those uh, those actors that uh, more or less exist on uh, on blockchains. We have uh, nodes, full nodes. Uh, simple nodes. We have the miners. We have the developers that create the um, the blockchain, and of course, different third parties. We have um, exchanges. We have wallets. Uh, we have decentralized applications, uh, etc. So, can we find any liability uh, to any of those actors? Uh, let's start with the miners. What do the miners do? So, the miners are going to verify transactions. They're going to add blocks on the blockchain. Are they uh, controllers? Well, they they do validate uh, submitted data, so they do uh, participate in the in the processing of the personal data. But however, they do not uh, determine the means and purposes of the blo of the of um, of the processing of the personal data. So they are not alone. They do not take autonomous decisions uh, about how uh, the blocks are validated and how the processing is being done. But are they processors? So. So, 
um, the, uh, the French uh, Data Protection uh, Authority, the CNIL, uh, recently g uh, gave a published report about uh, GDPR compliance and the, um, and the blockchain and said that the miners could be data processors. Uh, processing uh, personal data, but that poses the problem of who is the controller, for whom are they, um, are they uh, processing those personal data, and what is the relationship between those two actors? Um, developers. Uh, so the developers, uh, let's say, uh, well, we take the example of the of the Bitcoin um, uh, blockchain. So they define how the data is processed uh, through uh, by by maintaining the protocol. Are they controllers? Um, yeah. So they could be considered uh, to determine um, the means and purposes of the, pro of, the of the processing, but they are not alone in that process. They are always bound by the consensus and the uh, and the by technological requirements, and um, so they they do not remain autonomous in how they 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 determine the means and the processes. Of, uh, of the processing of the personal data. And also that could mean that if we actually believe that the developers are data controllers, that, that could uh, lead to uh, applications about uh, all open source developers. Are they all uh, data controllers? Can they all be liable under the GDPR? Next, we have the third party. So we have, uh, as I told you, exchanges, wallets, decentralized applications, etc. So they analyze blo blo blockchain data for commercial purposes. Uh, let's say an ICO, for example, um, they could qualify as uh, data controllers for the data that they request for the users. Again, think of the ICO example, uh, all the public keys that they, um, that they are going to, uh, to publish, uh, the transactions they're going to publish once they collect the funds. Um, they are going to be responsible for all the data that they store off-chain. Um, sorry, I don't know. Um, however, Regarding the on-chain data, still we need to uh, find if they could be also be the processors, but they do not. They do not. That does not appear uh, to be the case. Uh, think, for example, um, a decentralized application that runs on the on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, does that mean that uh, we we qualify th uh, the third party as a data controller, and then the Ethereum uh, uh, the Ethereum Foundation, uh, the Ethereum blockchain uh, foundation as the data processor? But there is no contractual contractual relationship between the two. So that also seems quite problematic and very unlikely to happen. Finally, we have, uh, well, almost finally, we have the full nodes. So um, uh, we, we take the example of the full nodes because uh, they are the ones that download the whole blockchain, they download the blocks and the transactions, the ver and they verify them against uh, consensus rules. Again, similarly, there has been a, pr um, there has been a proposal that th they could be uh, that they could be considered as joint controllers, so all the nodes, all the full nodes, could be considered as the people that take the decisions um, uh, uh, about how the um, uh, the, proce the processing of the personal data is going to happen. However, there is no contractual relationship between the nodes, and they all act uh, individually. Um, but uh, and also, uh, they cannot be uh, considered as individual controllers uh, because um, they are. Uh, similarly, as the developers, they are subject to the rules that are uh, the, the design rules that are created by the developers. So this is like a, a, a reciprocal um, uh, relationship. Finally, uh, we have the users. Uh, so uh, a user that just uh, simply goes to uh, um, to make a transaction on the blockchain. Uh, they could be uh, this, they could be data controllers and data subjects at the same time. So data subjects that have control over their data because they can use their private key. Um, they are bound by the consensus of the blockchain, and so uh, they cannot be they cannot be uh, even though they are uh, they can they can be subject uh, to to be considered as data controllers for their own data. They cannot be considered data controllers for the data uh, when they participate on the full network. So that again uh, means that they do not uh, they cannot uh, be qualified as uh, data controllers in general for uh, all blockchain data. So, conclusions. First of all, the, as all lawyers are going to say in this, in this case, is that it depends. Everything depends on the blockchain. Everything depends on the governance of the blockchain. Are we examining, uh, 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 on, the, on the third party's perspective, are we examining uh, whose personal data are we examining? 
So we need to look at the specific governance structure of a given blockchain and the specific use case and also the specific uh, data, personal data that are at stake. And finally, uh, the GDPR principle of controllership, so how we identify those actors could be rethought again given the fact that one, uh, a lot of personal data are essential for the functioning of the blockchain and two, that we're talking about an architecture that was not thought of when uh, the GDPR was, uh, was being discussed and uh, was being uh, enforced uh, at the end of May. So, yes, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, th that are uh, really uh, important, uh, kind of essential questions that were addressed here. Um, I still ha have the feeling it, it is not clear, right? I mean, this is uh, as often, uh, unfortunately, um, it is not clear so far. Uh, other other questions over there. Uh, maybe you can wait until we have a microphone. Thank you for your talk. Um, one of the aspects of the GDPR that I think you didn't cover in your presentation is the article on chapter five about transfer of personal data to third countries, which is something that, for example, in a public blockchain, if you are you know, processing something, data might be processed by someone that is outside the EU. I, I, do you have any comment or, or on, on that? Well, the, so the specific problem about enforcing the GDPR is specifically exactly what you said, is that uh, once you have either a node, a user, a miner, uh, a company that uh, processes data that refer to a European citizen, then the GDPR applies to the whole blockchain. So this goes both ways, goes to either uh, taking, taking uh, the data outside of to, to third countries or also uh, even when one individual from the blockchain uh, is part of, the, of an EU uh, country or processing data that refer to, 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 EU, uh, to an EU citizen. So uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's the big problem, actually. Does this mean that, for example, does this mean that if I'm a company that is going to process um, this data uh, for European citizens, I am automatically obliged to use a private blockchain where I know all my miners are inside the EU. So, the, yeah, the, different, the difference between uh, permission and permissionless uh, blockchain is that in a permission blockchain, you can actually control that. So that means that you, th it's much more easier to identify the actors. In, uh, you have specific miners, you have specific uh, parties, identified people that, uh, uh, that uh, take part in the decision-making processes. So in that case, uh, applying, uh, being compliant to the GDPR is uh, easier. But in the public blockchain, as you would say, the in the permissionless one, this is where a lot of problems uh, uh, occur because there is no way to, of knowing. Uh, how to enforce. Hi, you started off by a definition and that definition contained two words, natural person. I was wondering if you'd done any thinking on unnatural persons, thinking of AI agents, which are uh, like deep mind recites itself, I think. So I was just wondering if the law had thought of unnatural persons <laughs> and the consequences of... Well, yeah, we're talking about natural persons because uh, personal data refer to the data subjects and that means individual people. So th uh, those are the data that we protect and we do not protect data that refer to uh, an AI. So that was, that's, that's, the, that's, the, yeah, that's the meaning behind natural persons. There's another, okay. can, can you wait for the mic, please? Thank you. I have a rather uncomfortable comment to make, and that is um, that such a thing as a permissioned blockchain does not exist, because a block blockchain is by definition decentralized and immutable, which means a permissioned blockchain is not a blockchain, but an encrypted ledger. It's just a comment. To my knowledge, there is no official definition of the blockchain, so that is to be determined. Uh, yes, um, there are some definitions about a blockchain. Yeah, there's a lot. And that is, it has there's to no have single one, though. So, I mean, uh, five, say five properties, and uh, yeah. de being decentralized and permission, uh, decentralized and immutable are five of the central definition points of a blockchain. I mean, yeah, we could say permission distributed ledger. Yes. If that makes you more comfortable. Yes. But yeah. <laughs> All right, further questions? 
Otherwise, I think we have deserved, uh, at first, you have deserved a big applause. <laughs>